will not talk of this entity. I mean, I'm, <laughs> the title is Closing the Hole, Heaven or Hell. And uh, we were going to talk about uh, pulmonary atresia with VSD, which is a totally different entity. Here, we have in the rule good coronary arteries, sometimes with funny root, but very bad pulmonary arteries. With pulmonary atresia and tax septum, this is the other way around. Bad coronary arteries, but good pulmonary arteries. And you just heard about transplantation. We spoke about heart transplantation with intact septum, and we just spoke about uh, pulmonary transplantation uh, when there is a VSD. And the challenge here is not so much within the heart, but outside the heart. And it's much more difficult for us, for cardiologists and surgeons, to go around that. So before answering the question of the VSD, I would like also to show you how maybe we can push the repair so far that we don't have the dilemma to know whether we can close the VSD or not. That is a good preparation of the pulmonary arteries. This is what we're talking about, this kind of uh, patients here. And uh, obviously the stage one and stage two are regular fallow. It's not a challenge at all. You can do it as a regular way. You can put a bt shunt in the neonatal period if you want and just correct that after a few months. I would like to concentrate, on my, and, and here usually you have a pressure, right ventricle, left ventricular pressure under 60%, and those patients are doing fine. I would like to concentrate on the type three, very diminutive pulmonary arteries, or type four, when there is no pulmonary arteries within the pericardium, and those are the very difficult cases. Now, um, let's go a little bit on, on the therapies, and uh, we know there are two schools to handle those patients. The first one, a little bit more traditional, is what we call the stage repair, and I show you a few examples. And then it was challenged about 10, 20 years ago now by first the Boston groups, which brought this philosophy of early correction, and Frank Henley in San Francisco started to do direct correction on those patients. And at the end of the 90s, the French groups uh, came with another one, an aggressive rehabilitation of the pulmonary arteries, what I call the French correction. It was Marseille, it was Paris, now it's also Melbourne, and this is the approach I used since more than 10 years now, and I, I'm a strong believer in this approach. Let's look at the stage approach. This was uh, uh, sponsored by Roger Meir, for instance. They were doing first a right thoracotomy here, the so lung is there. They were bringing all those map casts here from the, uh, the descending aorta within one or more vessel here that was connecting with the BT shunt to here, the uh, uh, subclavian artery, for instance. A few weeks later, they were going on the left side, doing the same, unifocalizing all those pulmonary arteries uh, peripherally and putting it uh, through a uh, Gore-Tex shunt on the subclavian artery. And in a third session, they were bringing everything in the middle here, bringing uh, maybe patching here some stenosis and putting a valve conduit here and maybe more or less closing the VSD. It always looks very nice on drawings, but when you do this kind of surgery, it's never so nice to, to have that. And the results here, if we look at this series, for instance, they have 61% of complete repairs. That is closure of the VSD, separation of the two circulation, a mean of three operations, but usually much more than that, mortality one patient. It means in 40% of the patient, we still had two ventricles, but a uh, parallel circulation. Frank and Lay uh, decided to make the direct correction after something like four or six months with a median sternotomy. He was getting very deep uh, within uh, the descending aorta here, getting all the map casts in one shot here in the middle, and then he was creating a, a RVPA connection to the right ventricle, and again, a selective closure of the VSD. It's very difficult to know if you can do that or not, because if you look at new angiograms, you have almost nothing intrapericardium. So he was using this test here to know whether he could close the VSD, he was putting a roller pump here with uh, some uh, uh, blood here in the reconstructed pulmonary arteries, and he was getting here a normal cardiac output. And if the pressure was remaining low, he said 25 millimeters of mercury, he would close the VSD, and it was high, he would leave it open. But actually, we have no data at all, even if his article uh, that was published there. But this is a method he said he was using uh, uh, for that. Now, the disadvantage, in my opinion, is first, there is a limited uh, utilization of the native pulmonary artery. Almost the potential for growth is abandoned here. 
if we look at the wall of those reconstructed vessels, we have much more Mapka wall as a native pulmonary artery wall. And in my opinion, those can grow, those probably will have a pathologic growth. And some Mapkas are extremely difficult to reach, especially on the left lower lobe. And some of them come even from the celiac aorta, which is, in my opinion, uh, impossible to do that. But still, he achieved excellent results, I think, with this very challenging group of patients. And here, the biventricular repair was a little bit better. He had 30% only of patients where he could not close the VSD, at least not in the first uh, operation. And he still had some patients he had to have a stage approach because anatomically he couldn't do that. But his mortality rate was the best, at least at that time. If we looked at the results now, those patients with acceptation has, I would say, a very good survival rate. But the other ones, the VSD, multi-stage, it drops like hell here. And this is exactly the kind of patients he were having in this group here, not so much in this one. And this is heaven and this is hell, I think, uh, for those patients. Now, the rehabilitation of the PAs. This is a method that I personally uh, prefer. It has a growth potential. It didn't grow because there was no blood there. The ball is more or less normal. At least it can respond to normal signals. It is a very nice tutor if you have to do a unifocalization. The wall has a better quality to saw that in. You then can do a target unifocalization. Everything which is dual perfusion, maybe you can close the VSD uh, with catheter methods and so And it allows you to do percutaneous intervention just to delay a little bit your operation and have a bigger patient for that, or also to develop the pulmonary arteries. This is more or less what we do. We just put a patch between the right ventricle and the pulmonary arteries here. How can we do this rehabilitation program? I think we have to investigate those patients to look for the seagull uh, aspect of the native pulmonary arteries. And we have better methods to image that. But we have to say that many of them were there, but not visible, because uh, it was difficult to, to make that uh, into um, appropriate means. Uh, important, in my opinion, also, is to respect the critical period of adaptation, that is, of growth. And to me, the best period is in the first months of life. And I like to do the rehabilitation after already six weeks of life, and usually within the first four months of life. And now, stage four, this is what we call stage four. Even an angiogram doesn't show the seagull if there is almost no flow through it, are frequently actually an extreme form of stage three, which has a much better prognosis at the end. And I'm questioning whether we have so many of those patients. Of course, sometimes you have nothing within the pericardium. You can have two doctors going in both lungs. But those situations are a little bit different. You can stand them and then uh, handle them. Most of them still have a seagull here. We will see more and more of those patients now that we have better means to image them. This is what we have, uh, can see if we very aggressively look at the angiogram, put more contrast material and so. So the seagull is present, but not always visible at least. least. Second thing is we, you cannot assess the perfusion, the segmental per, uh, uh, distribution of those vessels, but you don't need it right now. You will need it f uh, that fast, uh, later on, and you will have time to do that. Now, the first stage is just something like that. And, uh, I, I like to make an exploration if I'm not really uh, sure whether it's a type 3 or a type 4. And if I find here an artery with a bulbous here, I would do this method here, an RVPA connection. In my opinion, much better than a Gore-Tex shunt, for instance. Obviously, it is a difficult uh, operation because the CPB with big map cas is difficult to handle. Pr suddenly, your pressure drops, your heart dial uh, distance, and you have to do it ver very uh, correctly. I like a right angle cannula here that I can push behind the tricuspid valve to decompress the right and the left ventricle because there is a VSD. Both will be decompressed. I cool that a little bit the patient, and usually, if I can avoid uh, 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 cross clamping, I do it or I do a cross clamp just to open up the infundibulum here, resect a little bit of muscle, and I declamp the situation because it's much more stable when the heart is beating uh, on those. And uh, I do the patch here on a beating heart. You 
usually have no air problem because the hole is so big that the air comes out of the heart and not through the aorta. Another thing is I never use Gore-Tex patch. I use something very soft here for a good growth and a good uh, uh, going of blood through that. In my opinion, we need for a good growth of those arteries a very wide pulse wave. And this is the highest you can have because you have the systolic pressure and the telediastolic pressure at, at the end. The Melbourne group uh, is preferring here putting a Gore-Tex shunt on the aorta. Obviously, you don't need a hard lung machine to do that, and it's much more stable during the, uh, the procedure. But in my opinion, you don't have this very uh, high pulse rate. And at the end, after uh, three or four months, they connect it here to the right ventricle with a bigger tube. In my opinion, you can avoid that by only one operation here. But again, it's a rocky uh, hard lung machine at this uh, moment here. Stage two, it's between two months and maybe one and a half years, and it's catheter, catheter, catheter. Really very important, many of them are done. And first of all, it will give you, at this time, a re, uh, reliable segmental anatomy of those patients. Second, you can dilate native pulmonary arteries, make blood go in, in better segments. Also, it allows you to close some map cars. And Felix raised a very good point uh, this morning. It's sometimes difficult to know which one you could do. But if you, you, you close them, the competitive flow is reduced in the native pulmonary artery, and they grow much better later on. And it also reduces an excess of QPQS. At the end, it gives you also a more reliable Nakata index, which is something it's, it helps to have it uh, in your decision making, but it's obviously not the only uh, parameter you will take. On the first stage, it's a correction. It's done usually after one year, one year and a half, and it's a RVPA valve, conduit always a valve within this. Plastics of the pulmonary arteries, this is the moment we would do it, not before that. It's much more difficult, it's too difficult, and also the children are too small. And now only are targeted for uh, unifocalization. Usually you have only one or two map casts to put on those central pulmonary arteries. Now comes the question of the VSD, and obviously of the talk. Is it hell or is it heaven? I think you can even uh, handle that with uh, um, having in the hell. We like scientists very strong numbers. When can we close that when it is dangerous to do that? The Nakata index can help you. Usually it's 150 millimeters uh, per uh, metre quarry. At least 15 lung segments, but are the segments really uh, fully open? Usually you have stenosis with those map guides. It's difficult to assess that. But you can use a dynamic test of uh, Frank Henley. Usually, and it's my opinion, we are still going a little bit with some gut feelings here. But uh, we are usually uh, relatively good. If you have good quality of arteries, and usually arteries of uh, a good opening, you can do that. But the troublesome VSD is still there. And actually, it happens in 10 to 15 percent of those cases. Again, we are talking of stage three and four, not the first one. And, uh, but if you make a mistake here, it's not always as a deleterious if you really follow them and react at the right time to do that. I will show you that here. Our goal now is to stay under 10 percent of overtreatment, that is, you close a VSD you, you, which you should not have cold, uh, closed and stay under 5% under treatment. That is, you leave a VSD open which you could have cold. Obviously, you go better if you leave it open for the postoperative period. But midterm, long term, you will pay it uh, the hard price. And this is why I'm a little bit more aggressive to close those VSD and see what happens. Obviously, you can close them when the Nakata index is OK. When the arterial saturation with almost no MAPCA is already over 85%, it means the blood flows through the lungs. And in my opinion, also, if you have only one or two MAPCAs to focalize, if you have more than that, very, you should be very careful. I usually get out of machine. I left a, a PF open. I'm not too sure it helps. Uh, but and usually I do a modified ultrafiltration for 10 minutes because it uh, has a reputation to take some cytokines out and uh, improve the pulmonary vascular resistance. I'm just waiting half an hour in the operating room just to see how things are going. In the, if the pressure, right ventricle to left ventricle, and this pressure should be high enough. Don't work with pressure of only 70 systolic. You have to be around 100 or even more than that, because this uh, uh, ratio has no value uh, otherwise. If it's under 80%, it will improve with time, within two days and so. I usually just decannulate and send the patient on the ICU. 
If I'm between 80 and 90 percent, this is a gray zone. We have two situations. I have to assess first the uh, pericardial uh, pulmonary arteries. And sometimes you have a stenosis that you can relieve, and sometimes you also have a compression of the dilated aorta. Those di aorta are always very large because they were supplying all those map casts here. And we have done in a couple of times, we have reopened up, went on the hardline machine, reopened up, and put a stent here intraoperatively, and the, the ratio was much better later on, and we could still uh, keep the VSD closed. But it's a second run on CPB, but still you have your cannulas here, you have your cannula in, and it's not a big stress on the heart. Now, it's still heaven for me. Even uh, you decide you're still on CPB. Now, if you decide it stay 80, 100%, and you ensure you're better off to reopen the VSD. But again, it's not a big deal here. You just make your machine run again. I usually just open up here the only patch here. I don't cross clamp the aorta again. I just take the patch and, and remove a big piece of it, something like five millimeters in diameter, and I close the conduit. So it's just a run of the hard lug machine of 10 minutes, 15 minutes, usually extremely well tolerated. Now, if you are on the ICU, you are on a purgatory. It can go to hell or it can go to heaven. Two situations. You left the VSD open and uh, it's, uh, you have a bidirectional flow uh, and then a left to right show. Or you closed it and your PR, uh, right ventricle, left ventricle ratio is around 100%. Let's see the first situation. I mean, here, you, will, you may need to, to put a PA bending of the pulmonary arteries, but you have time to do that. You can le let go a few days and do that uh, even on the ICU or on your patient. It's still, to, in my opinion, to heaven, and then you might be able to close uh, the, uh, the VSD later on. Second situation is much more difficult here. You still have a, a high ratio here. It can improve with time. It can improve with medication, but also with catheterization. And you should go in the cat lab on the following day and see if you can improve the situation. If you can, you're still in a heaven situation. More difficult, there is no improvement, and you have to reopen the, the, the VSD. Then you have to go in the OR, put a second machine, and do it. This is when you go to hell, because you put a deleterious CPB on those patients, but usually it's not more than 5%. So this is a surgical upgrade we can do on those patients. The worst situation is a central shunt on the pulmonary arteries. This is already much better. You bring blue blood through the lungs, and also you have the potential for some growth. And then here you are much better uh, again. And if you go, as long as you go in this direction, you go to heaven. If you go backward, you go to hell, especially if you have to reopen a VSD. Well, I will go very quickly on our experience, but uh, I can just say to uh, you that we had an optimal growth in this rehabilitation in at least 70% uh, uh, of the patients. We can unifocalize them usually. We didn't have a, a lot of map casts to put on, on them, and the results were quite good. But still, the type 4 was difficult. I must say, nah, I think we had more type 3 in this type 4, but it was uh, labeled like that at this moment. In this, we had only 50% of patients with uh, two separati uh, separated. So in conclusion, is it hell or is it heaven? Well, I would like to show you two illustrations of the same event. This is Napoleon crossing the Alps for the Bataille of Marengo. And Jean-Louis David was the painter, the official painter of, uh, the, uh, of Napoleon. And you can see very conquerors Napoleon. He's jumping over the Alps. Unfortunately for him, there was a Swiss painter in the Alps on this day. And he also showed Napoleon <laughs> crossing the same passage here on a donkey. And he's uh, exhausted, almost depressed. And I must say, we surgeons look at our performance more or less like that. Cardiologists always look at us like that. And I must say, for VSD and MAPCAS and so, I tend to believe my cardiologists. We're not so good, unfortunately. And this is a little bit my conclusion. My, the uncertainty uh, regarding the possibility to close the VSD are around 10%. This is for sure. But uh, still, some patients can have two uh, ventricles and can go to heaven. But they are probably type 3 and type 4, no more than 50-60%. And hell, in my opinion, in when you have two ventricles, it's extremely frustrating, and the circulation cannot uh, uh, be separated, remain parallel. This is actually hell much more than when you have to reopen a VSD. Thank you.